Welcome, everybody, to episode 259. I rarely introduce the number of the episode, but we're getting up there with our topics and how we look at divorce and certainly try and make the best out of it. So the topic for today, you're not a failure just because you're getting divorced, I think is a really important topic. There are so many reasons why people get divorced. But within all of the reasons, most people feel like a failure. It doesn't even matter whose fault it is, who's, who's better or worse in the relationship. People will feel like a failure, whether it's a short-term relationship or a long-term relationship. We are set up in society to feel like failures. But I take a whole different view of this. First of all, I take a whole different view of life. Life is a series of challenges. Life is an education. Life is a journey in understanding ourselves, our world, and how we relate to it. And certainly how we work in relationship to other people, whether it's a marriage, a friendship, a family relationship, a business relationship, it doesn't matter. Relationships all require a lot and they require a level of self-awareness. They require truthfulness and they require self-reflection in order to constantly improve them and guide them forward. And also the awareness that if the relationship is over, it's over. And you can't beat each other up because the relationship is over. But what do people do in relationships? So when they see the relationship being over, they either start other relationships clandestinely, or they start acting out in their current relationship they do something to hurt themselves. They do something to hurt their spouses. We just don't understand how to communicate in conflict. We've never really been taught this. So we start doing things. Our behavior starts acknowledging how we're feeling inside without really talking about it. And it's so important that we learn how to communicate in conflict and communicate in relationship so that we can either remain in the relationship longer, if it's a good one, if it should be sustained, or we can get out of it in a better way without starting other relationships, without going into substance abuse, without anger management. So I want to take this opportunity in this episode to talk about, A, how to get yourself out of the failure head but how to get yourself in the moving forward head. How do we make good out of the end of this relationship? So I put some thoughts down for you. You're not a failure because you're getting divorced. I can't say that enough. It doesn't mean that your entire life is a failure. And that's kind of how we look at it. Because we're getting divorced, all of a sudden, we are failures, and we are not failures. Everything we experience in life is a learning lesson. It's how we change as a result of our experiences that matters. Okay, stuff has happened. You're either in a long-term relationship that even with therapy has broken down, or you're in a long-term relationship and you can't get your spouse to therapy, or you're in a long-term relationship and you don't want therapy. You simply want out. The opposite of that is you're in a short-term relationship and you realize this was a not, not such a good decision to get married to this person. Then get out of it as fast as you can. If it really, really is an acknowledgement of, oh my God, why didn't I see what everybody else was telling me? We don't. We don't. None of us do. It's very difficult for us to listen to people say, are you serious? You're marrying this person? Are you, are you out of your mind? This is so not the right person for you. We don't want to hear it. And then 
we understand it once we're there. So you're either in a short-term relationship or a long-term relationship. And for whatever reasons, it's not working out. If you are the perpetrator, you must apologize. You have no other option. That's the only way you're going to make this right is to apologize. So if you believe you're the one who eroded the marriage and divorce is now inevitable, you can change the emotional trajectory of the divorce by apologizing, but apologize without putting any blame on your spouse. All right. Now, what could have gone wrong? Well, first of all, I've said this before on other episodes, but if this is the first episode you're ever listening to, sometimes we marry the wrong person and we knowingly marry the wrong person. Let's just start with, holy hack, I can't believe I did this. Why didn't I see this? Why did everybody else tell me to think twice, slow down? Maybe you want to uh, be engaged longer, spend a little more time with this person, go to couples therapy before you get married. Very difficult. Very, very difficult. So I can't tell you the number of mediations that I've had or conversations that I've had generally with women. I can't think of having what I'm going to tell you as a conversation about I married the wrong guy. I haven't had this conversation with men. I don't know why. Maybe women just tend to open up to me more than men, but plenty of men open up to me. But this has generally happened at the end of a mediation. Uh, the man has left first. Can't wait to get out of the room. The woman is there talking. Women like to talk. Women, you know, you like to talk. And if you get an ear like mine, who's compassionate, who listens without interrupting and only ask questions when I feel you're done, I will get the confirmation and the and, and just divulging. I married the wrong guy. I knew I was marrying the wrong person and I did it anyway. I questioned myself that maybe I wasn't, that I was scared, that I was nervous, that I really wasn't um, looking at him properly. I'm the one who asked him to marry me. He, after three years of dating, he wasn't. This is what I hear. But when I hear the woman say, because again, I haven't had a man, man say this to me yet, I married the wrong person. But men, if you're listening and you know you married the wrong person, okay, it applies to you. But I have never heard these women say to the men, you know, I really didn't have a good feeling going into the wedding. I really questioned my decision to get married to you, not because there's anything wrong with you, just because it didn't feel right just because it didn't feel right. You checked all the right boxes because this is what they say to me. You've checked all the right boxes. He's checked all the right boxes, but just in the pit of my stomach, I felt it wasn't the right choice, but then they override that. See the, the, the pit of our stomachs, that's what I'm pointing to right now. The pit of our stomachs is kind of our truth meter. When we are connected with something and someone correctly, we feel great. We feel satisfied. We feel healthy. We feel whole. When we are making the wrong choice about anything, we feel unsettled. Our stomach doesn't feel good. We don't feel grounded. But yet we talk ourselves into the decision. Listen, I have a worst case for you. You, Those of you who have been with me a long time maybe have heard me tell this story. But years ago, I had a young girl come to me. I mean, 20s, early to mid 20s. And she, her parents spent a lot of money on the wedding. 
it's the wedding day. And you know, on the wedding day, there's just a lot going on, including pictures with a photographer and little brunches and get togethers with the groomsmen or the bridesmaids. Something happened. I don't remember exactly what happened before the ceremony, but at the event site and he punched her in the stomach. You know, when you punch somebody in the stomach, especially when a man does that to a woman, you can't breathe. It's happened to me. You can't breathe. You really are scared. You don't know what to do. I mean, you normally don't go around with people punching you in the stomach. That doesn't happen to most of us. And when it does, holy heck, it shatters us. Then what do you do? You're at the most expensive venue in Los Angeles. You have 300 guests waiting for the ceremony to start. Your dad's there to walk you down the aisle. And you just got punched in the stomach by your soon-to-be husband. What do you do? Well, I bet, speculating, I bet most dads would say, call it off call it off. I had a bad feeling about him anyway. Yes, they will. I don't care how much I've spent on the wedding. Call it off. We can party anyway that you finally made the right decision. And there have been people who have done that. Partied anyway, because now they made the right decision not to get married. Okay. But that's an extreme case. It's not extreme though. It happens more than you realize that people simply marry the wrong person knowingly, but want to convince themselves otherwise. All right. You've married who you think is the right person. Here's the other example. You start the marriage, but once it goes from dating to actually being within the legal confines of the marriage, things can change. People let down their guards. Now you get to really know who you married. And they get to know who they married. And we're not the people we thought we were. They are not the people we thought they were. Or it's going along just fine. And we meet somebody else that makes us realize there's a whole nother deeper level of commitment and connection that we didn't even realize. We thought we were making the right decisions. But when we meet this other person, we are shown what real love is, another level of love. So what do you do? Well, you don't turn to drugs and alcohol and anger. That is certainly not the way. Or other uh, other people, other relationships. You don't do that. That doesn't solve a thing. You have to deal with your present situation and going into substance abuse, food, alcohol, drugs, um, gambling, porn, other relationships, and then maybe just losing our control over our emotions or keeping a hold on some mental health conditions that we had that maybe we haven't defined yet. Maybe we haven't really gotten help with, but these mental health conditions can be held in abeyance. When we meet somebody we're excited about, you know, the endorphins take over. And then when we get married, the hunt and the chase is over. We settle into routines And we can't hold those mental health conditions in abeyance. They come out. Now what does the other spouse do? Holy heck, I had no idea. This is what you do when you're upset. This is what you do when you don't get your way. This is what you do after I've said yes to you. You know, maybe they turn into horrible housekeepers. Maybe just the duties that, your spouse has taken on, he or she is crumbling at those duties. I mean, anything can happen. Life is a journey. Relationships are a journey. But you have to apologize if you're the one whose actions are um, 
have resulted in the breakdown of the relationship, and now you are getting divorced for these reasons, you absolutely have to take accountability. Taking accountability means everything. It means that, first of all, you've come to another, another level of self-awareness. It means that you now have a clearer path forward um, in terms of what you have to do to shore yourself up and to make amends to your spouse. But do not do it and blame the other spouse at the same time. Well, I was really wrong, but if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done this. Don't go there. Don't go there. It's so not worth it. Just take account, account for your own actions. And that's the start. And don't don't expect your spouse to say, okay, honey, thank you. That's all I was wanting. They eventually may do that. But they may say something like, okay, so now you want to take accountability. Now that we're getting divorced, now that the damage is done, well, a lot of help that does me, let them say whatever they want to say. Let them get that out. That's the way they need to react, at least right now. But you take accountability for yourself and apologize for whatever it was you did that caused the breakdown of the marriage and the beginning of the divorce process and go through that divorce process with compassion and empathy. You don't have to be a dish rag. You don't have to roll over. You can still go through it like, you know, a little bit more of a business decision. But if you go into mediation, give in a little. Compromise. You know, just say, look, I am so sorry I did this. I am so sorry this caused the breakdown of the relationship. And in this, in, in this divorce settlement here, I'd just like to give you a little bit more. I just it's my way of showing that I really am sorry. Why not do that? That's easy. That's stuff. You're giving up stuff. You can always get more stuff. Okay, after the apology, change your behavior to whatever is needed in the first place, to whatever was needed in the first place. Change your behavior. You cannot change the past, but you can change the present. And that's what people don't do. Change the present. How many times have I been in a mediation where there's been substance abuse issues going on or anger abuse issues going on? And you're the one, <laughs> let's just say you're the one that has substance abuse or anger issues. Change them. Change them in present time. Go to get therapy. Acknowledge in the mediation. You're right. You're absolutely right. I did smoke a lot of pot. I checked out. I did have several cocktails, beers, glasses of wine after work, after dinner. I did go to my room and not participate with the family, shutting you all off and going on the computer. Change the behavior. That's what your spouse needs to see. And that's what you need to do. If your behavior caused the divorce, work towards changing it. Not only are you doing the best for yourself, if you have children, you're doing the best for your children as well. And the only way you can rectify the past is by correcting the present. And as you correct the present, you're going to start feeling really good about yourself. You're going to start feeling proud of yourself. And as we feel proud of ourselves, we're going to want to do better with our own lives going forward. Certainly if we get into another relationship, but we can be productive for our children's lives. If we don't have children, at least we can leave this marriage doing the best for our spouses, soon to be former spouses that we can possibly do. And that's the best we can do. If we look at life as a learning experience and that our learning experience experiences our growth experiences, we will never be victims. And we do tend to put ourselves in victim head a lot, don't we? 
Life will always then be fair. Life will be fair because through our trials and tribulations, we will accept them as tailor-made growth experiences that can challenge our will to live, test our ability to succeed, and drive us to accomplishments we never fathomed before we were tested. I mean, that's a huge statement. Listen to this again, dial it back and listen to it again, because this is the philosophy I have always lived by. I've always wondered what the purpose of life was. I look around and say, my God, it seems so unfair. Why do we have to deal with all this crap? Why do people have to be mean? Why do I have to be mean? Why can't I be nice? Why am I driven to behavior that I don't even think is right, but yet I do it? Why did I have this horrible accident that I never saw coming? I was driving at the right speed. I was obeying all the driving rules and I got plowed into. I mean, look at the Boston Marathon. You know, the people that were uh, changed, physically changed for the rest of their lives. Look at people who have deathly, well, near-death illnesses that they're actually working to overcome. Didn't see it coming, lived a healthy life, never smoked, never did anything harmful to themselves. Who knows what our life lessons are to be? But, and this is Oprah, she looked at life as a classroom. What do we need to learn? In fact, Oprah tells a story about when she was five years old. So she had a very rough upbringing. She grew up in Mississippi. Um, I don't know that they were dirt poor, but I, they didn't have money. Certainly they didn't have Oprah money as she has it now. Nobody has Oprah money, my God. Well, very few people have Oprah money, but we have Oprah experiences. So the story I heard Oprah tell years ago on her show was that at the age of five, she was brought, I think, by her father to live with her grandmother. I think her mother was persona non grata. The point being, she was brought to live with her grandmother. And that first night, her grandmother had her sleep on the porch, not even in the house, five years old, sleeping on the porch. And Oprah said, as scared as she was, as confused as she was, she just prayed, Lord, protect me, take care of me. I put myself in your hands. I, I'm not promoting a religion. That was a very spiritual thing she did. I'm just showing you how Oprah, somebody we all know, who's been through her, her own trials and tribulations, right? At five years old, she didn't scream, cry, blame. She just prayed for guidance. She prayed for help. She put herself in the hands of what she thought was someone who could take care of her. It's a learning lesson. All of life is a learning lesson, and we all have different lessons. We're all not supposed to be rich, I don't think. But, you know, are we supposed to be destitute our whole lives? Or are we supposed to use our circumstances to fuel us? to do better. I sincerely believe we all have greatness in us. I really, really do. What does greatness look like? Different for everybody. My nephew, John, high functioning learning disabled. I think he's 38 or 39. Now I'm laughing. I now know how parents feel when they can't remember their own children's ages. I don't have kids. I have cats, not kids. I can't remember my cat's ages. I almost forgot my own age recently. Then it, then it came back to me, came flooding back to me. But no, my nephew, John, 
high functioning learning disabled. Very difficult reading. Math, forget math. <laughs> I don't know that he's ever going to learn to do math. John taught himself how to read by listening to his favorite music, which was rap music, his favorite rapper, Tupac Shakur, and looking at the liner notes in the CDs and matching up the sound of the words to what he saw as words on paper. He literally taught himself as an adult how to read like that. Now, he can't read everything, but he can read a lot more than he was reading. His vocabulary, his verbal vocabulary grew exponentially. All of a sudden, one day, I'm in conversation with him, and he's using words I've never heard him use before correctly. And I'm like, oh my God, he has just like overnight. And I talk to him all the time, by the way. It's not like I talk to him a couple times a year. We live on different coasts, but he and I communicate a lot. We're buds. All of a sudden, like overnight, I was talking to a different adult. We can all change with the mindset to change, with the mindset to improve. We can all change. We can use life as a growth experience because that's what it is. If we don't use life as a growth experience, we can become suicidal. We can have eating disorders. We can work in a job that we simply don't like, that doesn't use our skills and talents. You know, this is a really wonderful changing world where you, we can take things that we love to do and make jobs out of them. I mean, we could always do that, but, be, but in the world of technology, it's a lot easier to do that. So if we can look at anything that happens to us on a daily basis and stop ourselves from getting mad and just say, wait a minute. What should I learn from this? What is this experience trying to tell me? I am telling you, you will turn your life around for the better quickly. Uh, and lastly, let's make art out of what we might call failure. Let's trust the universe that whatever we need for growth will come to us. Let's align ourselves with truth so that we can see how to change a challenging situation to a new level of understanding of ourselves. So that's the last step. We have to trust the universe that whatever is coming into our lives is right for us. Whatever we are manifesting, whether we are consciously manifesting it or unconsciously manifesting it. Things are coming into our lives and it really depends on how we view these daily circumstances, how we identify with them personally. Are we victims or are we looking at these as growth experiences? Why did this thing happen to us today? How can I use this to be a better person, to communicate differently, to view whatever the circumstance represents differently? How can I grow from this? That's all we can do is look at every circumstance, every situation as a growth experience. And if we can do that through divorce, we can certainly make the divorce better, at least for ourselves right now. But I'm telling you, I was reading a book by Bill Eddy, the master of conflict communication, and he was showing people how to communicate in conflict. He was you, he used a story uh, in the book, a real story, a woman who had contacted him after reading his book, and she took literally all of his suggestions, how to communicate in conflict in a divorce, because I think her husband may have had a mental health condition, um, either bipolar 
anger management issues or narcissism, something was going on, or he was just a lot angrier than she was because of the divorce. And she just kept steady. She used Bill's formula of brief, informative, friendly, and firm, never blame, never argue, uh, rein in the way you uh, respond, um, uh, don't be mean, don't be condescending, uh, everything is with forward movement. Just let's get to the point. Let's get to resolution. Let's see how we can work this out. She just kept steady when it was time to sign the settlement agreement, which I believe took a little while and they had to have attorneys because they needed people to interface communication for them. He sat with her and said, thank you. Thank you for teaching me how to be different than I was in this divorce. I have learned from you. I now want to be different. I think they had minor children to co-parent, so this was a very significant conversation. But even if they didn't, <clears throat> you're going to see one another at some points in time, more than likely, or you'll run into mutual friends make it nice. Just make it nice. Do the best you can to make it nice. If you make it nice for your spouse, if you apologize, if you use whatever you've done as a growth experience, as a learning experience, and then change, turn it around and change, man, you're going to come out a winner. And so is your spouse once your spouse buys into, there's a different way that we can look at our life together, look at the marriage that we had, look at what we grew together, look at what we accomplished together. Let's just focus on the positive, um, at least as the joint venture that we engaged in. And then what you each do personally in your growth evolution will just make the end the best it can be. So I hope this made, has made a difference in some of your lives because it's just so easy to feel like a failure and you just aren't. You don't have to be. Change is what's going to be your saving grace. Thank you very much for listening. Please share this with your friends. Subscribe if you've just stumbled upon this. Hit the like button. You know we all love that. Like me. Communicate with me through speaker pipe on my website, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. Love comments, love suggestions for other episodes. But I love that as always you have an amicable day.